My name is Tom O'Connell, and on behalf of the Colonel Rourke Memorial Society and other sponsor organizations, we welcome you to the centennial remembrance of the Easter Rising. First, I'd like to uh, thank the Greece American Legion Post 468 for being a great honor guard for today's event. So wherever they are, give them a hand, please. I speak for everyone here today when I say it is a great honor to come together to celebrate one of the great days in Ireland's rich history. Sure enough, an event that happened 100 years ago seems like, well, history. But to put it in perspective, when our grandparents awoke on the morning of April 24, 1916, it was another day just like the last, just like they had been for the last 700 years. Ireland and its people were denied the basic human rights of personal freedom, and their nation was held in bondage. That morning, a hundred years ago, freedom was still a dream. Today we gather to celebrate the people and events that led to Irish freedom and the creation of the Irish Republic. As we have prepared for this, I am struck by the spirit that has called us here today. We gather here fittingly on sacred ground. Holy Sepulchre's mission is celebrating life everlasting, the Easter promise. The Irish Patriots chose Easter Monday and the Easter Promise as an inspiration that through faith and perseverance, Ireland would prevail and be a nation once again. The leaders of the revolt believed that the Irish rising, though not a military triumph, would fan the flames of nationalism and Ireland would rise like the great phoenix from the ashes of failed domination. And so it was to be, 100 years ago today, the David and Goliath moment was at hand, and a terrible beauty was born. Today we'll be joined by many guests who will speak and help us understand the people and the events that helped shape a nation. Our first speaker is our host, Lynn Sullivan. Is uh, Lynn here? Uh, we have a, we, I know we have a stand-in for Lynn, and he's coming around. Lynn is uh, balancing her many tasks here today. There's been several celebrations actually here today, and Lynn's doing her best to make them all happen. Please welcome our host, Greg Camp, speaking on a little bit of telling us the history of Holy Sepulchre Cemetery. Go ahead, He is filling in for C Lynn Sullivan, the CEO of Hel Holy Sepulchre Cemetery and Ascension Gardens. Lynn and her team are focused on providing a sacred, peaceful resting place for those buried here, and they've certainly done so. I would give them additional credit for making Holy Sepulchre Cemetery a part of the local living community. This is not the first time that we have gathered here to celebrate our culture or, or those who are buried here who we love and admire. So, she is pleased, and Holy Sepulchre is pleased, to provide this opportunity to, offer, to honor Catherine Wheelwright, mother of one of the leading figures in Irish history, Eamon de Valera, a leader of the 1916 Rebellion and the future president of the, United, of the Republic of Ireland. Thanks, Tom, and thank you, all of you for being here today. Uh, my name is Greg Camp, and uh, I'm filling in for Lynn, who's at that other ceremony. I want to welcome all of you to Holy Sepulchre Cemetery and to thank you for attending today's event to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Easter Rising and of course, the life of Catherine Wheelwright. Holy Sepulchre, for those of you who do not know, was founded in 1871 by the very first bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Rochester, <coughs> Bernard J. McQuaid, who was actually the son of Irish immigrants. Bishop McQuaid's vision was to create a garden-like cemetery that would celebrate the lives of loved ones. And of course, it needs to be in a peaceful, prayerful, and reflective environment. Spring is a particularly beautiful time of year here at Holy Sepulchre, and many of our flowering trees and perennials are just starting to bloom. So today, Holy Sepulchre Cemetery and our sister cemetery, Ascension Garden, actually still adhere to the mission that Bishop McQuaid had for us. Holy Sepulchre Cemetery borders the Genesee River, Lake Avenue, and Dewey Avenue, and it occupies approximately 340 acres. It's the largest cemetery in Rochester, 
with over 1,500 burials each year, and one of the largest cemeteries in New York State. More than 250,000 people, including many of Irish heritage, call Holy Sepulchre their final resting place. It was also the very first Catholic cemetery to receive green burial certification. The cemetery stands witness to Rochester, New York State, the United States, and international history and events. Bishop McQuaid knew the struggle of the Irish and their persecution both home and abroad. In 1854, while working for the Diocese of Newark, New Jersey, Bishop McQuaid helped find a peaceful resolution after two Irish Catholics were killed by Protestant groups and riots broke out. He was well aware of the fact that the Irish American community represented and represents a very large portion of the Rochester area Catholics at the time of our founding and even today. He was very proud of the many monuments throughout the cemetery that feature Irish and Celtic influence. A couple of examples in section L, for example, there is an 18 foot Celtic cross that memorializes veterans of the Grand Army of the Republic, many of whom were Irish. Our cemetery was planned and founded by an Irish American. Throughout the years, countless other Irish Americans have influenced the growth and the development of our cemetery. In addition to Catherine Wheelwright, whom we honor today, this cemetery is very proud to honor famous Irish and Irish descendant individuals buried here. Some of them include Patrick O'Rourke, the leader of the 140th New York and was a hero who was killed at Gettysburg. George Ryan was a colonel in the 144th New York, 140th New York, and was also killed at a uh, battle in Spotsville Courthouse. Patrick Berry, a nationally renowned horticulturist and part of the Elwinger Berry Nursery. James Cunningham, the founder of the Cunningham Carriage Company. And Sister Geronimo O'Brien, a member of the Sisters of St. Joseph's, established St. Mary's Catholic Hospital and the home of industry for young women. Walter and James Duffy, father and son who impacted Rochester in regards to business and politics. So once again, we welcome you, we thank you, and we thank you for coming to honor Catherine Wheelwright and the 100th anniversary of the Easter Rising. We encourage you to take in the beauty and the history of the cemetery when this ceremony is concluded. And of course, we welcome you to visit anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brad. Thank you for your support. Irene. Our next speaker joined our committee a few years ago and has added a major boost of energy and talent to our efforts. The Honorable Rick Dallinger, former New York State Senator and currently a judge of the New York Court of Claims and acting Supreme Court judge in Monroe County. He is a lover of America and all things American, a great patriot. His love of history brought Rick to our group, and he would like to share his thoughts on the significance of the Irish Rising in Irish history. Please welcome our friend Rick Dallinger. Today, in a cemetery 3,200 miles from Dublin, we honor the mother of one of Ireland's heroes. We celebrate a family and their love, a mother and her son. We are all sons and daughters. We have a shared love of family, even when our parents may have only been recently recognized or are long gone. Sons and daughters all, we anchor our lives in our descendants. As Irish men and women, it is altogether fitting and proper that today we honor Catherine Wheelwright and her son, Eamon de Valera. But on this hallowed ground, on this springtime, with the new birth of life, we stand among crosses and tombstones, and we pause to mourn the loss of life. Sixteen men were executed a hundred years ago because they believed in the concept of freedom, liberty, and the ability to govern themselves. But these men, celebrated in song and poetry, were not the only casualties in Dublin a century ago. Other men who picked up weapons and fought for their freedom died in the uprising. Young men, some in their early teens, 
died either on the streets or the barricades. Englishmen, too, died on that fateful week, and they were all sons of mothers and fathers. Thousands of Irish men and women, sons and daughters all, of all faiths and all backgrounds, have died in the intervening century in the struggles on the island. As Americans, we stand here today knowing that we fought for our freedom from the tyranny of a distant monarch at the birth of our nation, and fought again nearly a century later, as Patrick O'Rourke did in our great civil war, to be freed from that ancient curse that denied freedom to our brothers and sisters solely because of their race. Our history teaches us that there are times and places when the human spirit cannot be shackled under the shadow of another's oppression. In the face of such forces, rebellion, even revolution and force, may be the only recourse to attain a more just future. But that same history also teaches us that the grim toll of such fights and the attendant violence, especially now in an era of unimaginable weapons of death and destruction, violence can erode our concepts of humanity, engender bitter enmities, hatred and anguish that persist, persist over generations, and weaken our collective faith that we can all live together as God intended. As Irish men and women, we have seen the terrible toll extracted in our homeland over the last century and recognize that violence, which too easily can displace understanding and compassion, is a threat to everyone, everywhere. Today, a century later, after Irish patriots decided to risk their lives, we, as part of the Irish family, must be dedicated to the same principles for which they fought and for principles that we, as Americans, have forever held sacrosanct and self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Irish men and women we celebrate today were chasing that elusive dream for themselves and their families. Our quest in 1776 became their quest in 1916. Our challenge today, as their heirs, is to not only remember their names and their actions today, but to rededicate ourselves to the many tasks before us and pray and work for a day when all men and women, having found what President Lincoln called a new birth of freedom, may live in peace on the island which we and our ancestors, sons and daughters of every faith, called home. God bless the island of Ireland, all of its inhabitants. God bless America, and God bless all of you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Patricia Carey, Pat Carey. She is a native of the Rochester area with a keen interest in Irish music as well as Irish and Rochester history. Pat's mother's family knew Catherine Wheelwright, having been members of Blessed Sacrament Parish where Mrs. Wheelwright was a daily communicant. Pat grew up hearing stories from her mother of an old Irish woman who often had a smile but always dressed in black. Pat will now give us a brief summary of Catherine Wheelwright's thoughts and actions here in Rochester as her son fought for Irish freedom. This is Rochester's own personal connection. Please welcome Pat Carey. Thank you. Tia uh, Quint, good day. Rochester has a unique place in Irish history owing to the fact that it was the home of Catherine Wheelwright for the last 40 some years of her life. She was the mother of Irish statesman Eamon de Valera. Kate, as she was known here, was born Catherine Cole in Knockmore, Brewery, County Limerick in 1856. And she emigrated to the United States in October of 1879. 
She first found work as a domestic for a family in New York City. She married a Spaniard named Juan Vivian de Valera, her employer's children's music teacher, on September 19, 1881, in St. Patrick's Church in Greenville, New Jersey. On October 14, 1882, at Nursery and Child's Hospital in New York City, she gave birth to her son, George Edward de Valera, then called Eddie, and later known as Amy. Vivian was advised to head west for, to improve his health. He did so, but a year later, in 1885, Vivian died. Kate had a hard life as a single working mother in Gilded Age America, and her brother, Edward Cole, who had also emigrated, convinced Kate to take Eddie to Ireland to be raised by his grandparents in Limerick. After a few years, or a few years later, Kate married Charles Wheelwright, an English Protestant chauffeur, and Kate and Charlie moved to Rochester, where Kate's sister Hannah had settled and raised her family. The Wheelwrights worked for Mr. and Mrs. Warren Whitney, uh, Charlie as their chauffeur and Kate as their nanny to their daughter Charlotte. The Wheelwrights had two children, Thomas and Annie, and in 1902 they purchased a home that still stands at 18 Brighton Street in Rochester. Kate and Charlie lived a quiet life in Rochester, working hard, raising their children, and Kate uh, was an active member of Blessed Sacrament Parish. Charlie later converted to Catholicism, and their son, Tom, became a Roman Catholic priest. Sadly, their daughter Annie died at the age of eight. Kate regularly corresponded with Eddie, now called Eamon, in Ireland, and went to visit him there in 1907. Their quiet life was shattered when, in 1916 when Eamon participated in the Easter Rebellion in Dublin and was sentenced to death for his role in it. She made an emergency trip to New York City to present the authorities there with his birth certificate, proving that he was an American citizen. His sentence was commuted. Thus began a life of activism for Kate, which included speaking before Congress on her son's behalf and being a founding member, along with Charlie, of one of the two Rochester units of the American Association for the Recognition of the Irish Republic uh, in the early 1920s. As such, she and Charlie hosted many meetings at their house on Brighton Street and arranged for several prominent Irish figures, including de Valera himself, to come to Rochester to speak and raise money for the Irish Republic. De Valera made at least four trips to Rochester. In June of 1919, he stowed away on the SS Lapland, arriving in New York City on June 11th, the beginning of a trip across America that was to last over a year. He wanted to sell bonds to finance the Irish Republic and to gain support in the U.S. Uh, and the, for the League of Nations to recognize the Irish Republic. He landed in New York City and entrusted two, two friends to deliver the following message to his friend Harry Boland, who had preceded him to New York. Rather unexpected, this, we'll tell you an idea when we meet. I am anxious to travel to Rochester tonight. Hope it can be arranged. I want to see you before I meet anybody. I learned a number of things since you left, dealing with the matter you came to investigate. If you are watched, better not come to see me, but travel to Rochester tomorrow or as soon as you can. Eamon de Valera went with Harry Boland to Rochester and spent a few quiet days there at his mother and stepfather's home. Their visit was secret and was neither confirmed nor denied by his mother when she was visited by a Democrat and Chronicle reporter a few weeks later. <laughs> Eamon de Valera's American travels allowed him to spend Christmas with his family in Rochester that year, and he spoke in Rochester while on a fundraising mission in 1920. Charlie Wheelwright died in 1927 when Eamon was visiting Philadelphia. He attended Charlie's funeral at Blessed Sacrament Church. It's possible that he also attended the blessing of the grave here at Holy Sepulchre. We do not know this. Kate died in 1932. As Eamon was in Ireland at the time and facing 
uh, an interesting year, he was not able to attend his mother's funeral. As far as we know, this is the first time that a direct descendant of Kate Wheelwright, other than her son, Thomas, has visited her grave. And we are very honored to have her great-grandson, Eamon O'Cleave, and his wife, Anya, join us today to pay respects to this unassuming yet remarkable woman. Our next speaker is Gail Shalboy. She's the past president of the Ladies Ancient Order of Hibernians and a longtime member of the O'Rourke and Owl Societies. Gail will help us understand the character and actions of Catherine Wheelwright as she wrote, campaigned, and spoke on behalf of her son and over 1,000 other Irish political prisoners. It should be noted that America and England were strong allies during the World War I era, and as such, the Wilson administration largely ignored the Irish envoys, including England developers, requests for support and recognition. It took a mother's appeal to, pe to pierce the silence. Gail will share with us Catherine's own words and writings. writings. Please welcome Gail Shalboy. My friends, I want to thank you for the love and the sympathy you have shown for my son. Your sense of justice is worthy of American men and women. I came to the Capitol as an American mother to ask our government to secure my son's release from prison. I know you have the powers to secure my son's release from prison. I know they have the power to free him, as they did last year for the Russian Archbishop Zepliak. And when they do intervene for my son, I pray that they will also remember the heroic Irish patriots in prison with him. Do you realize that while we talk here tonight, over a thousand brave Irishmen, as well as my own son, are lying in miserable cells in British prisons in Ireland and England. They, like the poor dear boys outlawed on the hills, are there because they loved Yaron and scorned to sell it. And they have been held prisoner for a year or more without charge and without trial. They have been called rebels against an Irish government. But the only government the Irish people made in our day is the Irish Republic, for over 80% of them voted in 1918. And to that government, my son and his party have been faithful. For the Irish people have never voted to disestablish it, so it still lives. The Irish people did not create this free state government. It is a British colonial government created by an English king and his government. And remember this fact. The Irish people have never been allowed to vote on the straight question of an Irish Republic or a British Irish Free State. Some people here have accused my son of calling out Irish boys to fight against their brothers. They have called him and his comrades traitors and assassins. That is all false. The truth is, he pledged over and over again for the Republicans after this free state was talked about. That they would abide by the will of the people in any free, fair elections on the question. But England's government never allowed that referendum to be have, held. <coughs> My son warned Griffith and Collins that if this justice was denied, the people, there would certainly be a civil war. He made a pact with Michael Collins that it would have avoided all war and kept the Irish people at peace until they could have a referendum. The Irish Congress, Dalyaran, unanimously accepted that pact. So did the Irish Republican Army and Sinn Féin, the political organization of the Republic. But Collins was immediately ordered to England. And when he came back a few days later, he said he would not keep that pact. But how could one man break a pact that a whole Congress affirmed? And the man that was forced to say what Collins did then, acting on foreign orders from Churchill and Lloyd George, was he the chief of the Free State? No. I say, 
It was and is a slave state. That civil war, civil war in Ireland was forced on the Republicans. They told you here it was a new war between Irishmen themselves. But I tell you, it was only the old war in a new shape, with black and tans and ex-British soldiers playing a big part in that Free State Army. For it was about this time that England demobilized the old Irish regiments in her army and sent them on to Ireland poor and without work, all ready to recruit them in the Free State Army, these men, some of them Irish once, most of them British. It was at the same time, you know, that England shipped tens of thousands of her soldiers from the south of Ireland to the Belfast Zone. And then she told the American people that she had cleared out of Ireland. But we are not altogether asleep here in America. We can still make four out of two and two. They tell you my son brought on the Civil War. The truth is, even after London obliged the Free State leaders to attack the old comrades in the four courts, my son and the Republicans were willing to dump their arms. They told the American citizen working in Ireland for peace that summer that they would be glad to stop their fighting, which was only a defense of the Republic, if a free election was promptly given on the question of the treaty with the new Irish registry, and with England withdrawing the threat of war as an alternative. Father Cahill of Chicago was the American acting with the Republicans, with, along with Archbishop Hardy for the Free State. But the Free State would not listen to peace on that basis. For, believe me in this, London did not want them to make peace with the Republicans on any other ground but complete surrender. No, Eamon de Valera did not bring on that war, but he did end it. As soon as he conduced the younger men, yes, and the women, to stop their militant defense of the Republic and begin again the political campaign he initiated three months after the treaty. One of the oldest and most revered judges in America has said that in 45 years of public life, I have never known a campaign of slander against any man so malicious, so subtle, and so widespread as that against Damon de Valera. People who repeat these slanders do not realize they're repeating falsehoods. And they do not know that not only did my son do all in his power to avoid civil war, but he withstood the pressures of Irish Republican army leaders who wanted him to court-martial and perhaps execute Collins and Griffiths. That was when they came back from signing the Articles of Agreement that his government, 36 hours before him, had ordered them not to sign. He would not do this, though. You remember that Greece executed all the ministers of state who brought disaster onto that country through the heating of Lloyd George and his friends. My son was more merciful. Some say too merciful. It was Washington who once said, I was misrepresented by the loyalists of my day, but now my enemies do me honor. And the day will come, and that soon, when the enemies of Eamon de Valera and his heroic comrades will do him honor. Last year, our government saved the life of a Russian archbishop by securing his release from prison. Why have we not secured the release of my son, a native of this land? Why? Is the life of a Russian-Polish prelate more precious than the life of an Irish leader? He has done no wrong, my son. He has only loved Ireland and stood for its rights. Washington, whose army was one half Irish, and Franklin, who went to Ireland to ask the Irish to come over and fight for freedom here, and Jefferson, who toasted the republics of the Wolf Tones Day, and Lincoln, who spoke openly for the Irish rights. These greatest of all Americans showed actively their support for the Irish independence and the Irish patriots. How can men today fill the seats made great by these men 
and yet refuse to lift their voices to save the lives of over a thousand Irish patriots. My friends, I thank you again from the bottom of my heart for your love and your sympathy and your fine American sense of justice. I pray God my son may one day be here again to thank you himself after he and his comrades have led old Ireland to freedom as complete as any nation in this world enjoys. Real freedom. The O'Rourke Society thanks you for honoring and sharing of Catherine Wheel Wheelwright's words with you. In closing, I would just like to share a couple more words of my husband's great grandmother who tended to the wounded Republican and British soldiers in Dublin during the Rising. She also had a mother's appeal, stating, every soldier is some mother's son. Elizabeth Rooney Murphy is buried just to ourself here in Holy Sepulchre. Thank you again. I will now be introducing a new committee member and newlywed Bill Herring, who, who plays in a band aptly named 1916. Bill re just returned, uh, Bill used his uh, graphic arts talent to design our posters and programs for today's event. So well done, lad. Yeah. 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 As I said, Bill just returned from Ireland where he married local debutante Patricia Lloyd. And, uh, I have to say now they're up. I haven't seen them since, so the honeymoon, honeymoon's still rolling. I think. Uh, Bill will now lead us in a Bill will now lead us in a song sung for the spirit of a nation. God save Ireland. Bill. Director of the 
St. John Fisher Irish Studies Program, Associate Professor Tim Madigan. Tim is an enthusiastic member of the O'Rourke Memorial Society and Irish American Cultural Institute. He will blush when I say that sometimes he is the wind beneath our wings, but really he opens doors and makes connections for us that we otherwise would not, would not be able to do. He has his hand, personally, in bring, bringing many of the components of today's celebration together. Tim has traveled to Ireland as part of the Irish Studies Program, and he will give us a special oration of W.B. Yeats' famous poem, 1916. Tom has a bit of the Irish blarney there, but thank you very much. I just wanted to mention, uh, I had the great pleasure of being in Ireland in the beginning of March. My colleague Jack Rosenberry is there for the entire semester with a group of uh, St. John Fisher students in Galway, and we thought we should alert uh, Deputy O'Quee that we would be honoring his great-grandmother here at the ceremony. So we went to his office and met with his lovely secretary, and much to my great surprise and joy, he immediately emailed back and said, my wife and I are coming. And that, uh, <laughs> that made us have to step up our act a bit, too. So we're delighted to have you here. Uh, <laughs> This, this was a hard act to follow, too, but I uh, probably uh, the best-known poem about the Easter Rising is uh, that of William Butler Yeats, uh, Easter 1916. Yeats knew personally many of the leaders of the Rising, uh, including Countess Markovitz, uh, Patrick Pierce, Thomas McDonough, and John McBride, who are mentioned in the poem. And he thought that although they, like himself, were dreaming of an Irish uh, republic, that it would never really happen. And he was greatly surprised when he learned of the Rising, and appalled when he learned that the leaders had been sentenced to death and many already executed. And this led him to write this uh, immortal poem, Easter 1916. I have met them at close of day coming with vivid faces from counter or desk among gray 18th century houses. I have passed with a nod of the head or polite, meaningless words, or have lingered a while and said polite, meaningless words, and thought before I had done of a mocking tale or a jibe to please a companion around the fire at the club, being certain that they and I but lived where motley is worn. All changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. That woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill, her nights in argument until her voice grew shrill. What voice more sweet than hers when young and beautiful she rode to Harriet's? This man had kept a school and rode our winged horse this other, his helper and friend, was coming into his force. He might have won fame in the end, so sensitive his nature seemed, so daring and sweet his thought. This other man, I had dreamed a drunken, vainglorious lout. He had done most bitter wrong to some who are near my heart. Yet I number him in the song. He too has resigned his part in the casual comedy. He, too, has been changed in his turn, transformed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Hearts with one purpose alone through summer and winter seem enchanted to a stone to trouble the living stream. The horse that comes from the road, the rider, the birds that range from cloud to tumbling cloud, minute by minute they change. A shadow of cloud on the stream changes minute by minute. A horse hoof slides on the brim and a horse plashes within it. The long-legged moorhens dive and hens to moorcocks call. Minute by minute they live. The stone is in the midst of them all. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. When may it suffice 
that is heaven's part. Our part to murmur name upon name as a mother names her child when sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. What is it but nightfall? No, no, not night, but death. Was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith for all that is done and said. We know their dream, enough to know they dreamed and are dead. And what if excess of love had bewildered them till they died? I write it out in a verse, McDonough and McBride and Connolly and Pierce, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn are changed, changed utterly. Terrible beauty is born. I now call Ben Nicotil forward. Ben's born in Dublin, local musician and friend to everyone. We wanted a good, strong voice to read the Proclamation of the Republic, or the 1916 or Eastern Easter Proclamation. We thought of Ben. Ben is very honored at being chosen. Ben shared that in 1966, on the 50th anniversary of the Rising, he was chosen to read the Proclamation for his school at Belly Fermat Tech. He said it was a huge honor, and now to read it on the 100th is coming full, so, full circle for him and is feeling hard to put into his own words. Must be doing something right, Ben. <laughs> ben, please honor us. Please honor this event with your reading. Going back 50 years here. Hoblock the Heron, the provisional government of the Irish Republic to the people of Ireland. Irish men and Irish women, in the name of God and of the dead generations from which she receives her old tradition of nationhood. Ireland, through us, summons her children to her flag and strikes for her freedom. Having organized and trained her manhood through her secret revolutionary organization, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, and through her open military organizations, the Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizen Army, having patiently perfected her discipline, having resolutely waited for the right moment to reveal itself, she now seizes that moment and supported by her exiled children in America and by gallant allies in Europe. But relying in the first on her own strength, she strikes in full confidence of victory. We declare the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland and to the unfettered control of Irish destinies to be sovereign and indefeasible. The long usurpation of that right by a foreign people and government has not extinguished that right, nor can it ever be extinguished except by the destruction of the Irish people. In every generation, the Irish people have asserted their right to national freedom and sovereignty. Six times during the past 300 years, they have asserted it in arms. Standing on that fundamental right, and again asserting it in arms in the face of the world, we hereby proclaim the Irish Republic as a sovereign, independent state, and we pledge our lives and the lives of our comrades in arms to the cause of its freedom and of its welfare and of its exaltation among the nations. The Irish Republic is entitled to, and hereby claims, the allegiance of every Irish man and Irish woman. The Republic guarantees religious and civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens, and declares its resolve to pursue the children of the nation equally, cherishing all the happiness and prosperity of the whole nation 
and of all its parts, cherishing all the children of the nation equally, and oblivious of the differences carefully fostered by an alien government, which have divided a minority from the majority in the past. Under our arms have brought the opportune moment for the establishment of a permanent national government, representative of the whole people of Ireland and elected by the suffrages of all her men and women. The provisional government, hereby constituted, will administer the civil and military affairs of the Republic and trust for the people. We place the cause of the Irish Republic under the protection of the Most High God, whose blessings we invoke upon our arms. And we pray that no one who serves that cause will dishonor it by cowardice, inhumanity, or rapine. In this supreme hour, the Irish nation must, by its valor and discipline, and by the readiness of its children to sacrifice themselves for the common good, prove itself worthy of the august destiny to which it is called. Signed on behalf of the Provisional Government, Thomas J. Clark, John McDermott, Thomas McDonough, Horig H. Pierce, Eamon Kant, James Connolly, Joseph Plunkett. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Next, I would like to introduce two local authors, Michael McCarthy and Joe Callan, for the sacred honor of reading the names of the 16 Irish Rising Martyrs. Mike is the current president of the Irish American Cultural Institute. He is a retired Rochester Police Department investigator and retired as director of security at St. John Fisher College. Mike has written two books on the Irish American journey. Mike is also on the advisory board for the Irish Studies Program and together with Tim secured the interest and a grant from the Irish Council General's Office in New York City to support and record this event. Joe is a retired carpenter, member of the Rourke Memorial Society, and full-time family man. Joe has published a three-book fantasy trilogy in the Irish vein. Now, let us remember those who laid down their lives to make Ireland a nation once again. Please welcome Mike and Joe. We remember the 16 martyrs of the 1916 Easter Rising. First, the seven signatories. Thomas J. Clark, born on the island of Wright. He was the first signer of the Proclamation of Independence. He was executed on May 3rd. He was 58 years old. Eamon Kant. He worked as an accountant for the Dublin Corporation. And he was also an accomplished Ilian Piper. He had played for Pope Pius X. He was executed on May 8th. He was 34 years old. Sean McDermott. He managed the newspaper called Irish freedom. He also suffered from polio. He was executed on May 12th at the age of 33. Thomas McDonough. McDonough was a teacher and well versed in literature, eventually earning him a position in the English department at the University College Dublin. He was executed May 3rd, he was 38 years old. Patrick Pierce, he had a degree in arts and law. His extensive public works were in both Irish and English. He was executed May 3rd, he was 36 years old.
Joseph Mary Plunkett, son of a papal count. He was a writer, a poet, an editor of the Irish Review. He was executed May 4th. He was 28 years old. James Connolly, born in Scotland, he had served in the British Army. He was unable to stand during his execution due to wounds he received during the Rising. Connolly was executed while sitting in a chair on May 12th. He was 47 years old. The other executed leaders Roger Casement. Born in Dublin, Casement was knighted for his services to the British Council. He was hanged in London on August 3rd, the only leader of the Rising to be executed out of Ireland. He was 51 years old. Cornelius Khan Colbert. The night before his execution, he said that he was proud to die for such a cause. I will be passing away at the dawning of the day. His execution took place on the morning of May 8th. He was 27 years old. Edward Ned Daly, close friend and brother-in-law of Thomas Clark. He was executed on May 4th. He was 25 years old. Sean Houston. He worked at the railway station offices. He was executed on May 8th. He was 25 years old. Thomas Kent. He was executed at Cork Detention Barracks on May 9th, following a court-martial. He was 50 years old. John McBride. He was a doctor and a chemist. He was executed on May 5th. He was 47 years old. Michael Mullen a silk weaver. He was executed on May 8th. He was 41 years old. Michael O'Hanoran. Prior to the Rising, he had published two novels, A Swordsman of the Brigade and When the Norman Came. He was executed May 4th. He was 39 years old. William Pierce, the younger brother of Patrick Pierce. He was executed on May 4th. He was 34 years old. These are the 16 martyrs of the Easter Rising. There seems to be a touch of destiny in play for today's event. Our next speaker heard about our event through contacts with Pat Carey, Tim, and another St. John Fisher traveling missionary, Jack Rosenberry. Eamon O'Queeve is a leading member of the Irish Parliament, serving as deputy for County Galway. He has served on many committees, including as Fianna Fáil delegate on the form of Peace and Reconciliation which was established following the Downing Street Declaration of 1993. Eamon is also the grandson of one of the great leaders in Irish history, a brave patriot in the event we celebrate today, and future Taoiseach and President of the Irish Republic, Eamon de Valera, who did so much to help shape a young nation. So we stand here today honoring our connection and the contributions of both his grandfather and his great-grandmother, Catherine Cole Wheelwright. I speak for all of us when I say we're so pleased and honored that you and your wife, Anya, could be part of the centennial celebration. Please welcome Deputy Eamon O'Keefe.
to all the people who have been involved in organizing this event. First of all, my thanks and all your thanks for what you have done in not only remembering my great grandmother, but also, and more particularly, remembering this very, very special day in our history, because it was a hundred years today that the rising of 1916 took place. I'd particularly like to thank Lynn Sullivan for her fantastic hospitality and welcome, Tim Medigan, Tom O'Connell, the chair of the committee, and Pat Carey, who has been doing so much research on my great-grandmother. I have to say it's great to meet so many relatives here today that I didn't know about. <laughs> and uh, that has been a real pleasure coming here to Rochester. Some I had heard about, but I have a lot more cousins than I ever believed. <laughs> but it's a great day here. But it's also a great day back home. Because we now celebrate a hundred years since the rising and the fact that we have an independent Irish state. And I think it's hard to imagine this day a hundred years ago. Because the number of people who took play, part in the rising was very small. And the leaders of the rising knew that they couldn't succeed militarily. But they believed that if they made a stand, that they would change public opinion. They would give hope to their own people, and that independence would be achieved. And so, as you know, it turned out to be. Now, my grandfather, Raymond de Valera, the son of Catherine Carl, I suppose if history had turned out slightly different, he might have wound up president of America if he hadn't been sent back to Ireland at two years of age. But his father, Vivian de Valera, died when he was very young and he was sent back to his grandmother to be reared. And I suppose it's the small things in history that make a big difference. And he grew up in County Limerick and got scholarships and through that method he educated himself until he became a professor of mathematics. He met my grandmother through the Gaelic League, where she was his teacher, my grandmother, Sinead de Valera. And he got involved in the Irish Volunteers tonight. They were founded in 1913, November 1913. And he rose through the ranks and became a combatant in the Volunteers and was in charge of the Bowlands Mills garrison in the rising of 1916. Now with his rank, he probably was very lucky not to face the firing squad. There were two contributory factors. One was that he was the last to surrender and he was taken out to Balls Bridge in Dublin before he was transferred to Richmond Barracks. And the second was that a case was made by various people, including his own mother, as has been already said, Catherine Wheelwright, that he was an American citizen. Whatever particular reason, he was condemned to death, as many others were. And when they came to review their policy, apparently what happened was they decided to execute Connolly and McDermott because they had signed the proclamation. But they started reviewing all the other cases, and the first name under the line was the name of one Eamon de Valera. And apparently the officer who had been dealing with the court martial was asked by General Maxwell, who is Eamon de Valera? And he said in the immortal words, he said, he's a schoolmaster, he will not cause you any further trouble. <laughs> He was sent to Dartmoor Prison in England, and in 1917, they were all released. Now, without going too long into the history, what happened was the vindication of the rising. In, the, in December 1918, 
a general election was held by the British authorities in the United Kingdom and in Ireland. And the Sinn Féin party, which had been reconstituted, decided that they would fight that election on the basis of setting up their own parliament in Ireland and ignoring the British parliament in London. And very, very famous people got elected in that election, including, for example, Countess Markievicz, who had taken part in the Rising. Amongst those elected also was Eamon de Valera and Cahill Broom. Michael Collins was elected in that election also. Late in 1918, very early in 1918, my grandfather had been arrested. Now, it kind of has an important part in my life in this way, that my mother was born while her father was a prisoner in Lincoln Prison, and she insisted at one stage that I would get her birth cert. And we put a frame in the birth cert, and she hung it on the wall in the house at home, showing that it showed, as it did in the birth cert, that the place of residence of her father on the day she was born was Lincoln Prison in England. Oh. <laughs> and my brother was very, very proud of that fact. As I said, the election took place in 1918, and on the 21st of January, 1919, Dáil Éireann, an independent parliament, was set up. Now, 70% of the seats in the whole island of Ireland had been won by the Republicans. And they set up their own parliament. Cahill Brew was in the chair because my grandfather was in Lincoln Prison at the time. But Harry Boland and Mike Michael Collins had gone to England. And my grandfather was in the prison. It's too long a story to tell you how they made the key to get themselves out. <laughs> But they made a key, <laughs> and I've been in the prison, and there were the only three prisoners, there were three of them escaped, there were the only three prisoners ever to escape from Lincoln Prison, and the prison is still a prison today. Wow. So he got out of prison, and he came back to Ireland, and he was made President of the Republic. But there wasn't a lot he could do there, so he came to America. And this is where America comes in hugely into the story, because he came over here and the first thing he did when he came here was to visit his mother in Rochester, as Pat has said. But he spent a year and a half here, and to all of you, whether your ancestors are Irish or not Irish, I have to say that Ireland owes you a huge debt of gratitude for the support that you gave at that time for the cause of Irish independence. And the community here in America and it was also, I've seen records, for example, that the Indian community, not the Red Indian community, but the Indian community from India, invited him to speak. The Red Indian community made him a chieftain here, a chief of one of the tribes. So not only was he received by Irish people, but also many other nations saw in what they were trying to do something that they too were aspiring to. And he traveled this country looking for support for the Republic and collecting money. And vast sums of money were collected which enabled the parliament and the government that had been set up in Ireland to function between 1918 and 1921. As you know, in a long and torturous road, we got our independence. In 1926, the year that Charlie Wainwright died, my grandfather set up the Fiona Fáil Party, of which I am to have the great honour to be a representative in our national parliament. He was elected Taoiseach in 1932 and remained Taoiseach to 48, was back again 51 to 54. He served as Taoiseach from 57 to 59. And he served as president from 59 to 1975, 73, sorry. He died in 1975. I can, of course, remember my grandfather very well because I was 25 years of age when he died. One of the highlights of his career, of course, was the visit of President Kennedy to Ireland in 1963. 
And I think it was one of the great moments for our nation when an American president of Irish descent visited Ireland, visited an independent Ireland, and was received by my grandfather. The following, the same year as you know, President Kennedy died and my grandfather came to the funeral. And on the following year, he came back on a state visit to this country and addressed the giant houses of Congress. And for somebody who had left this country at two and a half years of age, it was a huge road to have traveled to come back so many years later and to address probably the greatest parliament in the world here in the Congress of the United States of America. But it all really began with that lady, Catherine Wheelwright. It began with her because obviously she was his mother. But obviously he had to be sent back to Ireland because she had no way of working and looking after him at the same time in the conditions that would have existed in the late 19th century. But it is very, very interesting, the bond that grew up then, when he came over here in 1919, and that bond continued till our death in 1932. I have to also say that Charles Wheelwright seems to have been a very, very interesting character, and that he should not be left out of the equation, and the work that he did in the 1919-1924 period in support of his wife and also of what would have been his stepson. Can I also say that I hadn't realized that I came over here the huge role that Catherine or Kate Carl's sister had played in their life, Hannah, and to all of the descendants of the Carl's that were over here, can I say we owe you also a great debt. And I believe that when my grandfather came here in 1919, there was nobody at home when they went to the Wheelwright home and they had to go down to Aunt Hannah, as she would have been to, uh, to Eamon de Valera, to find where they were. And they found her and everything turned out for the better. <laughs> so can I finally say it's an absolutely fantastic moment for me to be back here. Back to my roots. We know that you Americans are all the time going to Ireland <laughs> to find our roots. But I have to come to America to find mine. The election, while I'm around, but I'm not all over them. The Henshaw even you. Is on our home, sir. I guess come around. The Dugan shall order freedom, which will respond to almost the Leochronidia Gashadia, and the stock which in Nicky and Yarmouth, the cheer show. What I've said in Ireland and Irish is that it's a great honour to be here, but it's particularly a great honour to share with you your commemoration of those great people who went out in 1916, men and women, and were willing to lay down their lives for their country. And thankfully in our generation, we have not asked to make the same sacrifices for my father born with, as for my father seer with. Good to meet say that also I have to recognize Anya O'Keefe. I met her yesterday and found out that she lived just down the road from all my relatives in Galway and showed me the pictures and she knew them all better than I did. So it was a great, a great time. Thank you very much. Next I'd like to call forward Deputy Amy O'Keefe, Anya, and Chris Shelboy for the laying of the wreath at Catherine Wheelwright's grave. Peg Dolan will accompany them with verses of the song, Baggy Do." And this will be followed by a moment of silence. As down the Glen Warn Easter Moor to a 
city fair road I There are lines of marching men In squadrons passed me by No pipe did hum, no battle drum Did sound its dread tattoo but the Angelus bell or the Libby swell rang out through the foggy dew. Oh, say, does that star spangled banner?